Thanks for joining us for Psoriatic Disease in Women of Childbearing Age. Um, this is the second in a series of four webinars that um, the National Psoriasis Foundation is doing. Um, the two other upcoming programs that we have are treatment adherence and uh, mental health and psoriatic disease connection. Um, these programs are provided by the National Psoriasis Foundation, um, supported by educational grants from Bristol Myers Squibb and uh, the Center for Disease Control. I uh, just wanted to present very briefly the disclosures. Um, the staff at NPF have nothing to disclose, and these here are Dr. Morassi's um, disclosures. Um, so really with that, um, I'll hand it over to Dr. Morassi, stop sharing my screen and give her a chance to bring up the presentation. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Fran, and for everyone for joining. This is a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. Uh, I've been interested in psoriasis and pregnancy for 20 years now and um, doing work in this area. So it's something that I really am very passionate about and very happy to take questions or have discussions later in uh, the talk. I designed the talk uh, first to, to provide information about psoriatic disease in women of childbearing age. And then I have specific patient cases where I thought um, we could have a discussion about how to manage uh, particular scenarios that physicians may encounter, in, encounter in their clinical practice. And then also I'm happy to take questions at the end of the talk, the talk as well. I'm gonna move forward here. My disclosures were already provided. So the objectives of the talk today include uh, discussing the clinical considerations in managing psoriatic disease in women. And specifically, we're going to first review the psychological impact. Um, we'll talk about hormonal influence, including menarche and menopause, and we'll talk about family planning. Um, and then also we'll talk about breastfeeding and pregnancy issues. So in terms of scope, one in five individuals in the United States um, uh, have a, uh, that have psoriatic arthritis are women of childbearing age. And 3.5 million women in the United States have psoriasis. Um, and 75% of these women uh, present before age 40. So they are of childbearing age. So this is a very relevant topic uh, for many patients within the United States. Uh, sometimes we're asked by patients, uh, what is the risk of passing on either the psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis to my child um, prior to pregnancy or while they're pregnant? Um, so in terms of heritability, if you have um, one parent with psoriasis, you have about a third risk, so 28% risk of developing psoriasis. If you have both parents with psoriasis, that increases to about two thirds, uh, 70 um, sorry, 65% risk, where the general population is about one to three. So there is a very strong heritability. In terms of psoriatic arthritis, if you have a mother um, with psoriatic arthritis, then it's a 22% chance of developing that, and father is 31%. So it's, again, about a third. On um, the general population, it is lower than psoriasis. It's 0.3 to 1% in the United States. And in terms of uh, the effect of hormones on psoriasis. This is something that I initially uh, studied you know, 20 years ago. Uh, we published in um, what is now JAMA Dermatology. At the time, it was Archives of Dermatology on how uh, the hormones can affect uh, psoriasis during pregnancy. And I'll go into detail about what we learned in the studies uh, later in the talk. But before initiating this study, um, there were other studies by Moad and colleagues um, and as, as well as Sevwick and colleagues that described um, hormonal fluctuations that had been reported. So um, patients had reported a worsening in menses and then at menopause as well, and also an improvement in pregnancy and then an immediate worsening postpartum. So there was a trend when estrogen levels would drop that you know um, during menstruation when they drop or at menopause when they drop or at the postpartum period, that the psoriasis would worsen, whereas when the estrogen levels would increase during pregnancy, there was a tendency for the psoriasis to improve. Now, psoriasis does affect quality of life in, um, in, in patients with psoriasis um, quite dramatically. So in a survey by the National Psoriasis Foundation, 
94% uh, of patients reported this as a daily problem in their lives. 88% reported that it affects their overall emotional well being, and 92% stated that it inter interferes with their enjoyment of life. And patients with psoriasis have an increased risk of depression, um, anxiety, as, as well as suicidality. So there is a very significant um, impact in um, uh, the quality of life. And also there's, there's um, a psychosocial component to the disease. And for women in particular, the stigmatization associated with psoriasis is higher than in men. So uh, women report psychological as well as sexual distresses um, more often. And also the quality of life is more severely impacted. So when analyzed, it, it, the, the, um, the symptoms of anticipation of rejection, feelings of being flawed, sensitivity to the opinion of others, and secretiveness, um, all four of those were higher in women than in men. And particularly if the psoriasis affects the genitals, the buttocks, the, the abdomen, those areas in particular have increased association with uh, sexual dysfunction. Now, um, I have to say, as someone that's very interested in this topic, I really didn't, didn't realize how much um, the stigmatization was a factor until I was caring for a patient who uh, was a female patient with psoriasis. And um, what I, was, I was asked actually to do uh, a, an educational video of psoriasis in pregnancy. And so the first patient that came to mind was a woman that um, had had a very difficult time um, with her first pregnancy and she was nervous about having um, uh, another pregnancy given the fact that she suffered so much from her psoriasis. And um, I encouraged her, I, I, I went over treatment options like we'll see later in the cases that I'll present today. And she was so grateful. She expressed such gratitude for having the second child after she had a successful pregnancy where her psoriasis was well controlled. And she said, you know, Dr. Morase, I, I finally have the family that I've always wanted. I deeply appreciated what you did for me. Thank you for everything that you've done. And um, the, the, the um, it, it, you know, I, so I thought she would be the perfect person to ask. And so I approached her. I said, would you like to be a part of this? And she said, um, well, I, I don't want anyone to know who I am. You know, I, 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 and I, and so I, I asked and I said, you know, we, we can modify your voice. We can not show your face so that it'll stay anonymous. And she said, Dr. Morasi, there are only five people in my life who know that I have psoriasis and you are one of them. And even if my voice is altered or um, my face is not shown, I can't risk um, other people knowing that I have psoriasis. And I think it was at that moment that I really understood um, in sort of a more guttural way how much the stigmatization um, can affect patients with psoriasis and, and, and particularly, um, you know, as I said, for, for women, this psychological and sexual distress is higher. Um, so I really think as providers, it's important for us to keep this in the back of our mind when we're making treatment recommendations for our female patients. So another thing that I think really is on the, the onus is on the provider in this situation as well, is to make sure that family planning is really addressed whenever there's some kind of therapeutic change and it should be addressed in all women of reproductive potential. So 50% of pregnancies in the United States are not planned with a healthcare professional. When we looked at data uh, that we presented at uh, the EADB, which is the European Academy of Dermatology and Venerology, and we looked at um, specialists in particular, such as rheumatologists or gastroenterologists and dermatologists, it was essentially 20% of the time patients would tell uh, a provider before they initiated the pregnancy, 80% of the time the dermatologist will not know that a pregnancy is initiated um, and a prior, to, you know, uh, in, in order to modify uh, a therapy that's being used for a chronic condition. So it's very, very important that any patient of childbearing potential is placed on therapy that um, should they become pregnant, 
um, they're aware of, of the risk associated with the pregnancy and that this has been discussed by the provider. The development of major organs, such as the brain or central nervous system or heart, starts the third week after conception. And most women discover that they're pregnant two to five weeks after conception when the organs have already been starting to form. Um, and the, the, the first trimester is a, a very, very important time for organ development and um, oftentimes the woman is unaware. Now, um, in terms of um, contraception for patients that are on long-term therapy, it's important to also remember that methods like spermicides or fertility awareness, withdrawal, um, um, and also uh, condoms have a greater than 90% chance of an unplanned pregnancy over a 10-year period of time with typical use. So these methods in particular really need to be supplemented with, uh, uh, with additional uh, contraceptive um, practice should that be the contraception that a patient is using if they're on a therapy that could potentially um, hurt the fetus. And um, it's, it's really difficult to change um, patient and provider behaviors, even with programs designed selectively for agents with fetal toxicities. So, you know, we've seen that over the years with isotretinoin use in acne, which is Accutane, uh, that it is very, very difficult to prevent pregnancies. The provider won't necessarily have the discussion with the patient or, um, um, you know, the, the, the patients will become pregnant without adequate contraception. And so it, it's just absolutely critical for the providers to be uh, keeping this in the forefront of their mind and putting safeguards in the clinic to make sure that patients when they um, come into clinic are screened for pregnancy and um, also lactation should breastfeeding be an issue. And it becomes even more important because psoriasis does not impact fertility at all. Um, in a Danish perspective study, there was no effect on an increased time to pregnancy with psoriasis in women. This was in um, over 20,000 uh, uh, pregnancies. And then also in men, um, significant scrotal disease could indirectly lead to reduced fertility due to increased testicular temperature. This is not relevant for women. Um, there's no impact on fertility. Now, in terms of the study that I performed that I, that I mentioned earlier, I wanted to examine how psoriasis changes in pregnancy and postpartum. And we found that um, about a third of the time patients develop dramatic improvement. And then about two thirds of the time, they actually worsened postpartum. Now, the reason that I designed the study is because um, as a, a medical student uh, years ago, I had a, a, a patient that came to what we call clinical correlate with the chair of the dermatology department. And the patient said that the only three times in her psoriasis completely cleared was during her three pregnancies. So I wanted to understand what it was about the pregnancy that caused this dramatic resolution of her psoriasis. And what we found was in that half of the patients that, that did improve, the improvement was actually very dramatic. And so in order to understand this diagram, if a patient, so each individual black line um, is a patient um, uh, in the study, um, and if if you reach the black line, the dotted line on the right, then the psoriasis would have cleared completely during pregnancy. If you reach the black line on the left, the psoriasis would have doubled in body surface area. So you can see for the patients that develop a worsening, it, it, you know, it, oftentimes it is not a significant worsening of the disease, but if they develop improvement, the improvement is very, very dramatic um, with over 80% of the, the body surface area of the psoriasis clearing during the course of pregnancy. Also, there's no clear evidence of um, increased adverse outcomes in pregnant women with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, which of course is, is important to keep at the back of our minds if we're trying to decide if we should initiate therapy in um, our patients with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis during pregnancy. So we want to know if the condition itself, uncontrolled, is somehow harming the, the fetus. And 
The studies are very mixed. This is from an article that I developed in the International Journal of Women's Dermatology. Um, when I was the editor of the journal, we developed, we had an initiative to look at uh, changes in psoriasis um, in women and how to uh, manage this specific uh, uh, patient population um, and the specific concerns that needed to be addressed. So within this article, if there was a significant difference in the outcomes of the pregnancy, so fetal deaths, spontaneous abortion, perinatal mortality, macrosomia, large gestational age, low birth weight, poor composite outcome, congenital malformations, and prematurity. Um, if it was significant, then with the psoriasis alone, there was a, um, a blue square on, on the diagram. If it was not significant, it was gray. And you can see that really this is sort of half gray, half blue. So it, it's, it's very difficult to assess whether or not the psoriasis alone resulted in, in um, an adverse outcome. So uh, compared to the general population. Um, there are resources for managing um, uh, psoriasis therapy in, in pregnancy. And uh, one that I um, feel is, is very helpful for patients is um, within the International Journal of Women's Dermatology, we publish an update on biologic safety for patients with psoriasis during pregnancy. And that's an excellent resource for both um, cl clinicians and patients. And then in addition, within the Journal of American Academy of Dermatology, I published a uh, continuing medical education, a CME series in March of 2014 that looked at the safety of dermatologic medications in pregnancy and lactation. And we um, have been asked to update that within the next year. So there will be an update coming out uh, probably in 2024. Uh, in terms of topical um, steroid use, so I'm gonna go through each therapy individually at this point. So we'll talk, we'll talk first about the topical corticosteroids. Uh, this is the only dermatologic topical medication that actually has a review within the Cochrane Um This is the only dermatologic um, medication that has a review in the Cochrane database. And there, um, it, there were uh, basically 11 uh, databases that were examined. All cohort and case control studies uh, were examined, you know, on tens of thousands of patients that showed that there really is uh, no risk to the, the, the fetus uh, with the use of topical corticosteroids. Um, there was a population cohort study developed by Dr. Chi that showed that if possible, keeping the amount of topical corticosteroid dispensed during the course of pregnancy um, could be uh, important to do. So you want to limit that to basically um, five 60 gram tubes or 300 grams. There was no association of, of um, uh, oral facial clefts, which would be the concern for, you know, for oral steroids, for example, which is why that was examined in particular, as well as preterm delivery, fetal death, and APGAR score. But there was an increased risk of low birth weight when the dispensed amount of potent topical corticosteroids exceeded over 300 grams. So that's one small uh, counseling point, and I keep track of how much um, topical medication I dispense during the course of a pregnancy. Um, in addition, there is the light therapy as an option, which is generally over many years has been considered the safest form of therapy. You do have to consider photodegradation of vitamins, including a uh, folic acid. So light therapy, um, uh, in terms of PUVA, which is sorolin plus UVA light, oral sorolin pills plus UVA light, um, decreases serum folic acid levels. And this has been described in the literature. Narrow band UVB um, uh, has mixed results. So this was from a publication that I developed in the Journal of American Academy of Dermatology when I uh, examined two um, studies. One was in the Egyptian Dermatology Online Journal that showed after 42 treatments, the baseline folate levels went down from 8.1 to 5.9. Um, this was a very well uh, done study where there was a study group and a control group. It was very, very nicely done. 
Um, there was also a study in the JAD that looked at patients that had received 18 treatments and concluded that there wasn't very much of a change, um, but there, there was uh, more evidence in this Egyptian Dermatology Online Journal. So as a result of this information, um, I always place patients who are on who are of childbearing age, women of childbearing age who are on phototherapy, I will place them on a prenatal vitamin each day to make sure that their folate levels um, stay high. None of the patients in the study reached folate deficiency, which is described as less than 3.7, but there is a pretty significant um, decrease that was demonstrated in at least one study. Now, Years ago, before we had biologics, cyclosporin was considered the treatment of choice for a severe psoriasis flare during, during pregnancy. Um, cyclosporin had not been shown to increase malformation risk in over a thousand births. This was primarily from the transplant literature. There was a question about potential for growth restriction, which was very difficult to determine given these patients uh, tended to be quite sick since they were in the transplant uh, realm. And then also cohorts um, of children were followed uh, from ages two to three that showed no neurodevelopmental, immunologic, or nephrogenic defects, uh, which is very nice to have this reassuring data that they were able to obtain in the transplant literature to show that there wasn't any effect on the children. Uh, we do have oral systemic therapy for psoriasis, including a premolast, which when they were using the pregnancy um, drug, drug classes, which have sort of gone out of favor after the PLLR or pregnancy lactation label ruling came into effect. But when there was pregnancy categories, it was labeled C because there was a dose dependent increase in abortions and fetal death in monkeys when patients were given uh, greater than two times the human dose. There was no malformations in mice and doses that were four times the human dose, but there really is insufficient data at this point. And so basically we do not advise using a premolas during pregnancy because of the lack of human data. Um, Ducrocidinib is a newer medication and there have been no effects on um, of embryo and fetal development in rats that were 266 times the human dose and in rabbits at 91 times um, the equivalent human dose. Um, so it looks like this is you know, potentially safe in terms of first trimester um, concerns regarding malformation, but really there is very insufficient data in humans. So it is not recommended, it's a very new medication for psoriasis. Uh, now I'm going to talk about the biologics. And before I do that, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the placental transfer of the anti-TNF agents. So, um, you know, just in, intuitively, if you're thinking about how evolution has evolved to protect the baby as, a, you know, uh, prior to the birth of the baby. The antibodies, it only makes sense for antibodies to cross the placenta right before the baby is born. The baby does not need to be exposed to antibodies prior to that. So um, in the first trimester, there really is essentially no transfer across the placenta. It starts in the very early second trimester. And then there's this exponential growth, which you'll see from the blue curve. It's very, very high um, uh, uh, increased transfer from the placenta over to the fetus. Just, it's almost like an antibody boost to prepare the child prior to the pregnancy, or, sorry, prior to the delivery. So there, in the syncytial trophoblast of the placenta, there's something called an FC receptor. And these maternal antibodies um, are transported across the villi grabbing on um, to the receptor and pulling it across uh, to, the, to, to, the, to the baby before the baby is born. So it's an active transport just prior to delivery of the baby. The IgG levels increase from early second trimester until delivery, but by far and away, the greatest transfer of antibodies is immediately prior to the birth. 
And the antibodies do stay in the infant serum for up to six months, excuse me, seven months of age. So if you look at infliximab or adalubumab or ustekinumab, um, these are IgG monoclonal antibodies that have a large, they're, they're these large hydrophilic proteins and they use the FC receptor. Etanercept is a fusion protein. It's gonna cross the placenta by simple uh, diffusion. So it's transferred less in the third trimester. The cord blood showed etanercept at, at levels of about three to 7% um, maternal levels, whereas infliximab or adalubumab were shown to be at like 160% or 153% of the maternal levels because of this active transport just prior to delivery. So there was a fatal case of an infant death in a mother who was taking infliximab, which is an anti-TNF agent during pregnancy. The mother was receiving infliximab every eight weeks for Crohn's disease and the infant was healthy until the BCG vaccine was given at three months of age. And then the, the, the child developed a widespread eczematous dermatitis, head lag and poor weight gain and died at four and a half months of age. So this was initially reported in the rheumatologic literature and then we brought this into the dermatology literature to make sure that, um, that physicians were aware of the concern of, of the potential for immunosuppression in, in the fetus. Now, since that time, it's been shown that the TNF agents do not appear to be significantly immunosuppressing um, the children, and there is increasing safety data to show that the TNF agents as a class are safe. But in particular, sertilizumab, which is in this class, is the only pegylated anti-TNF that does not have an FC region. So the study of, um, uh, the, this is specifically was studied in patients that were greater than 30 weeks um, pregnant in order to look at transfer during this time where usually there is active transport across the placenta. The study was referred to as the CRIB study. And um, the sertimazole levels were below um, detectable um, in 13 out of 14 samples, and one infant had a minimal level, which was 0 0.0009 um, in terms of the ratio of infant to mother serum. And there were no safety signals using this agent. So this is one of the TNF agents that, there, that has been studied um, in great detail. So next I'm going to talk about um, uh, another condition. So we we were kind of focused on patients that had a, a working diagnosis of chronic plaque psoriasis, but I do wanna talk about other forms of psoriasis that are very specific to pregnancy. And this is pictured here um, from an article that we have on uh, what's called pustular psoriasis of pregnancy. So this is considered the fifth dermatosis of pregnancy. Um, I will actually briefly review the other four dermatoses of pregnancy in the context of what we're going to be discussing later in the case of reports that we'll review. But I want to talk about this condition first just so that you gain some familiarity before we get into the cases. So this condition occurs primarily in the third trimester and patients will develop these erythematous plaques that are studded with these sterile pustules. So you can see in the picture, there's pustules that are kind of coating these plaques. And um, the, the reason this is so important to identify is that it's important to draw a calcium level in patients because it has been associated with hypocalcemia and this results in seizures and tetany um, you know, in, the, in the mother. So it's very, very important to make sure calcium levels are being drawn if this is suspected. Um, it begins in the flexural areas, and then it's, it spreads centrifugally from, from there um, classically, and it can occur in future pregnancies with increased severity. So that's an important counseling point should you encounter this in clinical practice. Also, the fetal prognosis is less predictable despite therapy. So here we have, um, uh, we've had a discussion about pregnancy. Now I'm going to refer to uh, discuss the postpartum period before we get into details regarding our cases. So this is from the study that I mentioned earlier that was published within 
uh, what is now JAMA Dermatology at the time, Archives of Dermatology, where we examined this postpartum flare for our patients. And we found that the postpartum flare was actually just a return to the baseline amount of body surface area psoriasis for the patient. So one represents the first trimester, two the second trimester, thir three the third trimester, four was six weeks postpartum, and five was 24 weeks postpartum. And you can see that there was a significant change between the first and second trimester, and then there was a significant return to baseline uh, after the baby was born until the six weeks gestation, uh, excuse me, six weeks postpartum period. Um, now, one important uh, counseling point and point to be aware of as a clinician caring for patients with psoriasis that are postpartum is this concept of um, Kebnerization. So Dr. Kebner years ago described how if the skin is traumatized, it can form psoriasis. And so we refer to this as Kebnerizing the psoriasis when there's trauma to the skin. Now, breastfeeding is a very traumatic um, experience. The, the, the child is, is sucking to be able to get the milk out of the nipple via the areola. And it's, it's, a, it's quite a, a, a rough um, uh, activity. Um, and so the areola and nipple are at risk of kebnerizing when the child is lactating. And this is a patient that I had where she did um, experience this uh, flare of her psoriasis on her nipples um, when the child was lactating. And so lactation consultants and latch are very, very important. Um, it's a very subtle art the lactation consultants have, have mastered um, and, and making sure that, that you have um, a, uh, a lactation consultant available to refer patients to or suggesting that the patient have the name of someone that they can they can contact or perhaps even meet with them prior to delivery, um, I think is, is really important to consider. Now, in terms of psoriasis therapy during lactation, um, we, again, I, I mentioned that we developed the CME article that talks about the safety of all dermatologic medications and lactation, including uh, medications for psoriasis. But it's very important to avoid acetretin, which of course should be avoided um, in, in any woman of childbearing age uh, for three years. Um, they cannot get pregnant because it, it can stay within um, the, the lipids in, 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 the, in the body. So we don't use acetretin for women of childbearing age, but it would be important to, of course, avoid this in lactation as well. Methotrexate, which is an abortifact, we do not use methotrexate um, uh, routinely in women of childbearing age for that reason, as well as a premolas that I mentioned earlier, um, just because of the lack of safety data. Um, light and topical therapy are considered very safe, but you do want to avoid class one cortisones on the nipple because the oral consumption by the infant could be significant. So using class um, two to seven uh, cortisones in terms of the strength of the cortisone, two would be the stronger one, seven would be weaker, would be fine to do. However, it's very important to be cautious with the use of topical corticosteroids on rapidly expanding skin. So this is a picture of a patient who was sent to me in consultation. She had been using mamedazone, uh, which is considered about a class four, so it's a mid-potency cortisone, twice a day for uh, three weeks. And because the skin of the breast is rapidly expanding and contracting during the course of the day, even with mid to low potency cortisones twice a day, if you're applying it to the actual breast skin where she had developed her rash, um, she developed pretty significant striae and thinning of the skin very quickly. So that's a very important uh, counseling point. And of course, for women with a gravid abdomen for when they ha are pregnant with their, their abdomen expanding as well. Um, the use of topical corticosteroids needs to be very uh, uh, prudent, you know, careful use with diluting the cortisone if possible on the abdomen and thighs. Now, in terms of using any kind of immunosuppressants, particularly the biologics, um, IgG transfers into, um, into milk 
really just significantly the first four days postpartum. After that, the primary antibody in milk is IgA. And so biologics in general have very low oral bioavailability due to their large molecular size and digestive system has a proteolytic environment, which is why these medicines need to be injected and not taken by mouth. Um, there is a neonatal natal FC receptor on intestinal epithelial cells that could promote uptake of undigested IgGs. So for that reason, um, uh, this was studied as I'll, I'll get into the um, in uh, the slide after this one about uh, the, the, the uh, CRIB study that was performed. So um, we did a survey to examine um, at, at the Maui Durham meeting, um, the perceptions of healthcare professionals to using these biologics um, to treating moderate to severe plaque psoriasis in women who uh, were breastfeeding. And um, a surprising number said that they were either neutral, somewhat disagreed, or strongly disagreed with using biologics during the course of um, the breastfeeding period. The cradle a study that was developed um, specifically, again, sertilizumab, as was mentioned earlier, how they studied in pregnancy very carefully. Um, they also studied lactation, and they found that um, the concentration of the sertilizumab in the breast milk was ex exceedingly low. Um, the highest concentration was 0 0.0768 micrograms, which was less than 1% of the plasma trough. And the average uh, daily infant dose was, was exceedingly low um, with no safety signals whatsoever. So really biologics, in including sertilizumab, but other biologics as well, should really be thought to be quite safe during uh, lactation. So it's concerning that that level of um, number of providers are still hesitant to use this in the lactating period. Okay, so now that we've completed the discussion of, uh, of, of pregnancy and lactation, I would like to talk about two cases. Um, so for the, the first patient case, uh, there was a 42-year-old um, a female. This was her second pregnancy. She did have another child as well. And um, she was at, at 28 weeks gestation when she first presented to me, when the dermatologist asked uh, me to be involved with her case. She did have history of a preterm delivery with her first child. Um, it was um, um, a, you know, a bit of a rocky pregnancy. She didn't have any rash, however, um, during that pregnancy or any uh, development of dermatitis. She didn't have any personal history of psoriasis but she did have history of atopic dermatitis and she had a family history of psoriasis in her mother. And she presented with a rash for uh, 10 days with these studded pustules and, um, and, and vesicles and they were on their, her arms, her thighs and her abdomen and there were no um, new antibiotics or medications that she had taken. So drug eruption was not on the differential diagnosis. And this is what she looked like. You could see that there are these, these, these thin plaques with these very fine studded um, uh, pustulars and some even look sort of like cloudy vesicles. And so the dermatologist sent her to me to rule out pustular psoriasis of pregnancy. So in terms of um, you know, the consideration, so in, in, in this situation, you know, it's, it's, not, um, it's not clear if she has pustular psoriasis of pregnancy or she could have something else. So I'm going to review the differential diagnosis uh, for the clinicians so that they understand um, what kinds of things we could, should consider in the differential diagnosis when we have a patient presenting with presumed pustular psoriasis of pregnancy. And then we'll talk about the diagnostic options that we have to clarify the diagnosis. And then we'll also briefly talk about therapeutic options and I'll get those um, into more detail later in the case. So. The first thing on the differential diagnosis is something called atopic eruption of pregnancy. So in this situation, the patient did have um, a history of atopic dermatitis, which is relevant. Um, and there's something called an atopic triad. So if a patient has history of asthma, eczema, or hay fever, um, that would put them in the atopic triad. And interestingly, 
20% of the time, this is reported as a flare of a patient's baseline atopic dermatitis, but 80% of the time in a large study of close to 600 patients examining uh, pregnancy dermatoses, this was actually their first manifestation of adult atopic dermatitis. And the way that I think about this is that the fetus is half of the father and the at the level of the placenta, um, you know, we want to make sure that the baby is sort of not being attacked um, for non-self, right? So it triggers this shift um, in the immunity of to be more cell-mediated uh, immunity, the Th1, to a Th2, which is more allergic dominant. And the, the hormone that does that is actually estrogen that causes that shift from Th1 to Th2. And so it's more common to become more allergic and have more allergic conditions during pregnancy for that reason. So this, if this um, shift does not occur, the fetus aborts. And so it, it, the atopic eruption does show up in the first trimester when this, this shift is occurring and it's going to occur on the nipples and hands. It's the most frequent pruritic condition in pregnancy and has absolutely no impact on fetal prognosis. So that one was called AEP or atopic eruption of pregnancy. There's also polymorphic eruption of pregnancy. We used to call this PUP, which was pruritic urticarial papules and plaques of pregnancy, but instead we now call it PEP um, because 50% of the time it's polymorphous. It can take many shapes in the skin. Um, so it, it can be urticarial as was suggested in the original name of PUP, but it can also be eczematous. It can be targetoid. They can present with tiny vesicles that are sometimes cloudy, like our patient is presenting with, with these cloudy vesicles slash pustules. And also it can even present with larger vesicles or bullae in, in some of the time. So this is the second most common um, dermatosis of pregnancy. It is self-limited and benign. It tends to occur later in the pregnancy in the third trimester. And our patient in this situation is in her third trimester. Um, and it's associated with the way that I think about this one, just like we thought about um, the AEP being a shift in allergic immunity. This one I think about being primarily a, um, a shift, a, a result of skin stretching. So wherever the skin stretches is where it tends to occur. So the associations are first pregnancy, the skin will stretch. Our patient in this situation is not in her first pregnancy. Multiple gestations. So if it's twins, the skin will stretch more. They're at higher risk or excessive maternal weight gain. Um, and it tends to occur on the buttocks, abdomen, and thighs. This patient is presenting on the um, buttocks and abdomen, but also some on the extremities as well. And um, incidentally, this also has no effect on fetal prognosis. There is also the third um, uh, condition, um, intrahepatic cholecystasis of pregnancy is also one of the pregnancy dermatosis. But this condition that is a genetic condition very high in Scandinavia and South America is pruritus that starts in the third trimester, but there's absolutely no skin changes. It's all secondary change from the skin being scratched and it's from bile acids crossing the placenta. So our patient has significant underlying dermatosis with the presence of these pustules. So she would not be um, a candidate for this intrahepatic cholecystasis of pregnancy. And finally, pemphigoid gestationis is a vesicular bullous autoimmune disease. And it's the best studied of all the pregnancy dermatoses, but it is the most rare. There's an HLA association, a genetic association with this. And um, it has been associated with an onset of trophoblastic tumor so that patients are often screened for this. Um, autoantibodies that are directed against the placenta uh, matrix antigen, because the skin and the placenta are both epidermal in origin, these, these antibodies attack the skin. They also attack the placenta. And that's the danger for the fetus because inflammation is occurring in the placenta and this leads to placenta Efficiency. And then again, um, the fifth dermatosis, as I mentioned, which is this, this is information was included in the, the, the previous uh, slides that I've shown. It's this fifth dermatosis of pregnancy in the third trimester, very rare. And then oftentimes there's no previous or family history of psoriasis. In our, in our case, the patient did have family history of psoriasis, which is why this is also on the differential diagnosis. 
um, and we we talked about um, um, this condition. So the first thing that we did was we did some diagnostic testing, and we all know that the calcium levels is going to be uh, very very um, uh, important to draw given that pustular psoriasis of pregnancy is on the differential and her calcium levels were thankfully normal as well as her liver function tests and kidney tests were normal. She did not have an elevated um, uh, uh, white blood cell count. She had normal uh, hemoglobin hematocrit and normal platelets. And also the bacterial culture did show staph. We did a biopsy as well that showed dermal hypersensitivity reaction um, there were superficial and deep perivascular mixed cell infiltrates, and there were lymphocytes and eosinophils. On the right upper arm, it showed a pustular dermatitis with eosinophils. And the, um, the histopathology that we received said that both pustular psoriasis of pregnancy and peptigoid gestationis were on the differential diagnosis. And the um, direct immunofluorescence was negative. Um, and there is a, a notation in the chat that was just listed. If you have any questions, please feel free to include them in the chat. And then after I finish the second, um, actually after I finish even the first case, I'm happy to take questions, but I can take questions after the second case as well. Uh, the direct immunofluorescence was to um, detect the pemphigoid gestationis, which was the fourth condition that we talked about where the antibodies are attacking the placenta. So, um, move forward here. So where are we? So this is um, modified from an algorithm that Dr. Christina Ambrose Ru Rudolph included in her, the largest um, study of pregnancy dermatoses that have been included to date, it's published in 2006. So when we're trying to understand um, a dermatitis, the, uh, first of all, we look to see, are there any um, primary lesions? So in this situation, there's absolutely primary lesions. There were these large plaques with studded pustules. So yes, we have a primary lesion. This is not intrahepatical cystasis of pregnancy. And then you have to think, is this related to the pregnancy? Because patients can get drug eruptions, which is why we asked about medications. They can get bolus emphatigo, which is why we cultured for staph and we treated for staph, we will treat for staph. Um, they can get ir allergic or irritant contact dermatitis. This distribution on the skin is not consistent with this or even things like scabies. So you have to think about other things as well. But then if this is a pregnancy dermato dermatite, uh, dermatosis, you have to think about onset and first site of involvement. So whether or not this is the atopic eruption of pregnancy is less likely given that it's an early, this is usually more of an early onset involving the limbs and trunk and her condition is more focused on the trunk itself. So then we think about third trimester onset, okay? The conditions with third trimester onset that starts in the abdomen, you have to do the direct immunofluorescence. And if you have pustules with, with the direct, a, a negative direct immunofluorescence, then um, the pustular psoriasis of pregnancy becomes very likely. If you have a DIF that's positive uh, and the umbilicus is involved and there's, there's bullae, then you think about pemphigoid gestationis. And if the umbilicus is spared, this is uh, the one that is the stretching of the skin um, and the direct immunofluorescence is negative, then you think of polymorphous eruption of pregnancy. So at this point with the negative DIF, we're looking at either pustular psoriasis of pregnancy or polymorphic eruption of pregnancy with the number of pustules, we're starting to think more, okay, this could be pustular psoriasis of pregnancy. So initially, while we were waiting for the test to come back, we placed her on fluosinonide ointment and mixed with Sarna to be able to dilute the, um, the cortisone um, and asked her to be you know, careful about her usage and the abdomen, but still apply it twice a day given the severity of the condition. We treated the, uh, the staff with the cephalexin. We also did, gave her antihistamines um, loratadine to take in the morning and diphenhydramine at night for the itch. She then comes in presenting two weeks later for follow-up following her biopsies. You can see the suture in place. Um, and she now has widespread bulla covering her body. And this does not occur in pustular psoriasis of pregnancy. So we have to go back and think about our differential diagnosis and diagnostic options. And the, the one diagnostic option that is still available for us to do at this point would be an ELISA, which is a blood test. 
And this actually confirmed that she did have a diagnosis of pemphigoid gestationis and not pustular psoriasis of pregnancy. Um, so this, this identified the antibody that's attacking that placenta as well as the skin. It's called bullous, um, bullous pemphigoid 180. It's a blood test that can be ordered. And then so she was started uh, immediately on a prednisone taper at 31 weeks gestation, and she was monitored for hypertension and gestational diabetes given this high prednisone dose. And then we had a discussion of IVIG, but she continued the, the, um, the prednisone throughout her pregnancy um, and, and, and had a successful delivery. So pemphigoid gestationis, the gold standard really has been over the years, the direct immunofluorescence test, where the, you can see a line, a green line on a black slide of those antibodies attacking the junction between the epidermis and the dermis and there's linear C3 deposition at that basement membrane zone. Um, classically, the ELISAs have been used to monitor disease severity. Um, patients with this condition, as I mentioned, have risk for small to date babies because of the placental insufficiency, and also they are at risk of um, a postpartum flare, and the child can have mild skin involvement because the antibody boost that they're getting across the placenta has transferred this antibody as well so that the children can have, um, have, have vesicles and lesions forming as a result of that antibody exposure. Um, it is self-limited and it recurs um, in, in sometimes in menses or, or with oral contraceptive pills or future pregnancies. And this is her um, after her prednisone taper where she's healing up from these um, large bullae that had formed. So, um, you know, so so I, I, I included that case, even though the final diagnosis was not pustular psoriasis of pregnancy, just because I wanted to emphasize the importance of making sure that we're doing appropriate diagnostic testing and how these patients can be managed. Um, so in terms of the second patient case, um, so this was a 32-year-old female. She had had one child before. Um, and her psoriasis flared very severely in her first pregnancy, given she was off all therapy. She was instructed by her rheumatologist to stay off her, her etanercept from when she was pregnant to three months, or sorry, two months postpartum. And she was currently on an etanercept when she first presented to me. She was taking 50 milligrams weekly. And the psoriatic arthritis had been flaring more lately on the etanercept than her skin. So her arthritis was actually more of a concern for her when she first presented to me than her skin. And she had been on light therapy for her psoriasis as a child because she had early onset of her psoriasis and really it had minimal improvement with the light. And also um, she had a history of, of using methotrexate for six years. And then um, she stopped after overlapping with the Tannercept for years. So she had been on the Tannercept for a few years um, with the exception of the time of her pregnancy. So considerations in this situation, you know, I think it's important to think about safe options for the patient's psoriasis if she conceives because she's considering pregnancy and also safe options for her psoriatic arthritis. So in this situation, I, I decided um, because sertilizumab, um, you know, does not cross the placenta during pregnancy and she was very concerned about the fact that the um, etanercept would still Cross, even though it's it's very minimal, as, as I mentioned earlier, it's a simple diffusion protein, so it doesn't um, cross at the levels that something like infliximab would, for example. And also, sertilizumab has been used for psoriatic arthritis for years before it was used for psoriasis because that was its first indication. Um, she elected to use sertilizumab and had a very successful pregnancy, much much more comfortable to her than her first. And then also. Um, uh, in this situation, I think approaching her fears regarding the current pregnancy was very critical in terms of having that discussion, as I mentioned earlier, about how the antibody really just primarily crosses late in that third trimester. Um, and then also talking about you know, um, how the fact that, that the infliximab or adalumab in the TNF class are transported much more so than something like etanercept would, and certainly much more than sertilizumab that does not cross the placenta. And so, you know, at that point in time, um, when she came in, I suggested that we switch the sertilizumab to control her psoriatic arthritis and to reassure her during the course of her pregnancy. And I also put her on a uh, folic acid supplementation with a prenatal, vital, uh, prenatal vitamin immediately 
so that um, she would have nice strong folic acid stores during the course of her pregnancy. So for final take home points, greater than 50% of pregnancies in the United States are not planned with a care provider. So make sure that any woman of childbearing age that you place on therapy are aware of the risk of their medications should they become pregnant. And really biologics for psoriasis have mounting safety data showing safety, particularly for the anti-TNF class in pregnancy as well as for breastfeeding. So hopefully I've communicated that um, during the course of the talk. So at this point, I always show pictures of my children whenever I give talks on pregnancy and lactation. So if you have any questions or comments for me, I'm very happy to entertain them right now. And this is my email address should you have any questions. So it's jemorase at gmail.com.